So um, I can't. Can you have the lights up for a minute, please? How many of you actually have ever heard of Dylan Thomas? Oh, not bad, not bad. Any any of you know where Wales is? <laughs> ah, is that to do with rugby or something? <laughs> right. So I thought I'm, I'm, I have what I have in common with Dylan Thomas is we were both born in Wales. And I want, before I, we begin, I thought I'd like you to have a look at a few images of Swansea. Many songs have been written about going home. This next song, to my mind, is one of the loveliest. It's called simply Swansea Town. Yeah, that's, uh, for those of us who live away from Swansea, that song is a kind of, it's a, a kind of expatriate national anthem. And we sit there and we cry 
as we see those pictures. And think, yeah, we should all be going back to Stonehenge. Bit of a tacky town, as you could see from it, couldn't you? It's a tacky seaside resort um, with a lot, of, a lot of gulls and some cars parked by the, uh, the beach. And this is what Dylan Thomas himself said about it. He said, um, I was born in a large Welsh industrial town at the beginning of the Great War. An ugly, lovely town, or so it was and is to me. Crawling, sprawling, slummed, unplanned, jerry-villaged, and smug suburbed by the side of the long and splendid curving shore where truant boys and sandfield boys and old anonymous men threw stones into the sea for the barking outcast dogs and on Saturday summer afternoons listened to the militant music of salvation and hellfire preached from a soapbox. That was Thomas's own view of the town where he grew up. But he was very connected to it. And a lot of his work is concerned with that seaside town and the landscape around it and the, the people that lived in it. And although when he was growing up there, it was fairly, as he said, I think a fairly dismal industrial town. Um, when I was growing up there, which was much, late, much later than Dylan Thomas, it had been bombed by the Nazis during the war. So the whole of the center of the town was, was empty and it had to be rebuilt over a period of a long time. So even when I was growing up there, it was pretty miserable. But you could always move away from the town and look to the sea. And that was always the, the great release of living in Swansea, as you lived near this, this wonderful sea. And the, the coastline around there is absolutely splendid. It's some of the most beautiful coastline in, in the whole of the UK. So that was very influential in terms of, of, of Thomas living up, living in, in, uh, in Swansea at that time. Um, I remember that my, far, my mother was a friend of, of Dylan Thomas's mother, for some reason or other. And they knew the, um, his sister, whose name was Nancy. And as, as uh, Dylan was growing up, he was, he was writing poems and he went to the local grammar school. And nobody really understood what he was doing. And as he, as he got older, he began to drink more and more. He used to come home and drink, he was drunk at night. His father was very angry, and the mother said, oh, but, you know, he's a genius. He's going to be a great poet. But nobody else in Swansea thought that he'd be a great poet. And for years, the Swansea people thought this is a really unpleasant young man who's just been writing these poems, and we don't know much about him. And is he really the kind of person we really want to be seen um, associated with our, our lovely seaside town? And so for a long time, there was this feeling that maybe... He wasn't quite right, and they weren't quite sure what he was doing with words, which you'll hear in a, in a minute. What was this guy doing, playing with words in the way he was? Um, and as he, as he developed, he began to get a little bit more known. He did a lot of broadcasting uh, for the BBC, and I'm going to read some of the, the, the work that he, he broadcast. Um, and as he got older and, and slightly better known, there was still no money coming absolutely no money, hardly any money being paid for these readings, certainly nobody buying much, much, many of much of the poetry or paying for it. And eventually, of course, he sets off for America. And America actually decides that this is a great poet. So in a way, the reason why I'm here tonight is because in, in America I have actually decided, in, in contrast to a lot of the, the people in, in the United Kingdom, that this was a great poet. And of course, he died in America in 1953. And I think Stuart Bob Dylan was named after him, I believe. So it, there's been a big influence in this country of this, this man from this funny little Swansea seaside town. Um, so a lot of his work is about observing the life of the seaside town and the kind of way in which people behave. So if you, you, but I'll read, I'll read to you the very beginning of his, probably his most famous piece, which is a radio play called Under Milk Wood. And it's a picture of a seaside town waking up in the morning. And it's sort of trying to give you an impression of what 
what it might be like. So when you're listening to these words, don't worry about the fact that you may not understand the story. That doesn't matter. What he's giving to you is a set of, of images for you to consider. So here's the very beginning of Under Milk Room. To begin at the beginning, it is spring, moonless night in the small town, starless and Bible black, the cobblestones silent and the hunched quarters and rabbit's wood limping invisible down to the slow black, slow black, crow black, fishing boat bobbing sea. The houses are blind as moles. Though moles see fine tonight in the snouting velvet dingles, or blind as Captain Cat there in the muffled middle by the pump and the town clock, the shops in mourning, the welfare, welfare hall in widow's weeds, and all the people of the lulled and dumbfound town are sleeping now. Hush, the babies are sleeping. The farmers, the fishers, the tradesmen and pensioners, cobbler, schoolteacher, postman and publican, the undertaker and the fancy woman, drunkard, dressmaker, preacher, policeman, the webfoot cockle women and the tidy wives. Young girls lie bedded soft or glide in their dreams with rings and trousseau, brides made it by glowworms down the aisles of the organ-playing wood. The boys are dreaming, wicked, or of the bucking ranches of the night and the jolly rogered sea. And the anthracite statues of the horses sleep in the fields, and the cows in the byres, and the dogs in the wet-nosed yards, and the cats nap in the slant corners, or lope sly, streaking and needling on the one cloud of the reeds. You can hear the dew falling and the hushed town breathing. Only your eyes are unclosed to see the black and folded town fast and slow sleep. And you alone can hear the invisible star fall, the darkest before dawn, minutely dew-gray stir of the black dab-filled sea where the Arethusa the curlew and the skylark, Le Zanzibar, Rhiannon, the rover, the cormorant, and the star of Wales tilt and ride. Listen, it is night moving in the streets. The processional slow, salt, slow musical wind in Coronation Street and Cockle Row. It's the grass growing on Lagarib La Hill. Dewfall. Starfall, the sleep of birds on milkwood. Listen, it is night in the chill squat chapel, hymning in bonnet and brooch and bombazine black butterfly, choker and bootlace bow, coughing like nanny goats, sucking mintos, forty winking alleluia, night in the four ale, quiet as a domino, in Ocky Oki, in Milkman's lofts like a mouse with gloves, in dye bread's bakery, flying like black flour. It is tonight in Donkey Street, trotting silent with seaweed on its hooves, along the cockled cobbles, past curtain, fern pot, text and trinket, harmonium, holy dresser, watercolors done by hand, china dog and rosy tin tea caddy. It is night neddying among the snuggles of babies. Look, it is night, dumbly, royally winding through the coronation cherry trees, going through the graveyard of Bethesda with winds gloved and folded and dew docked, tumbling by the sailor's arms. Time passes, listen, time passes. I'm closer now. Only you can hear the houses sleeping in the streets in the slow, deep, salt and silent, black, bandaged night. Only you can see in the blinded bedrooms the combs and petticoats over the chairs, 
the jugs and basins, the glasses of tea. Thou shalt not on the wall, and the yellowing dicky bird watching pictures of the dead. Only you can hear and see, behind the eyes of the sleepers, the movements and countries and mazes and colours and dismays and rainbows and tunes and wishes and flights and fall and despairs and big seas of their dreams. And where you are, you can hear their dreams. And the rest, and of course the rest of the, the, the piece, the play, is actually, it gives you the dreams of these characters who are sleeping in this town and waking and giving you their stories. And that was a huge success again when, he, uh, when it was first performed here in, in, in America in 1952, I think, originally. And what you can hear from that, the kind of way he's using words, he's not worried about a kind of a syntax that we can all understand. He's playing with words, he's repeating things, he's giving you simple images that you kind of you can remember. And I think it's very important also to, to recognize that for the Welsh, a nation which is, if you like, I suppose the least significant of the United Kingdom, <laughs> poetry has always been a very important element in their lives. As we were talking this morning about the Polish director, Tadeusz Kanko, who was a theatre maker in Poland during the most terrible times of, of, of life in Poland, that his work actually helped to retain a sense of, of Polish identity. And I think it's absolutely true that, po that poetry in Wales is, is part of the identity of the country. And of course, the, the Welsh are also great singers. So the kind of, the, the, the combination of the music and the poetry is something that gives Wales a very special feeling. And, and of course, if you come from the South Wales, you would read this beginning rather like this. It is spring, moonless night in the small town, starless and bald black, the cobble streets silent and the hunched porters and rabbit's wood Limping invisible down the slow black, slow black, slow black sea. So the, the accent is very different. Now, Thomas never had that, that accent. For some reason or other, he was always much more kind of uh, posh in the way he spoke. And I think that was deliberate. I think he knew he was going to be a, a, a significant, significant poet. And in order to make, a, make his way in the world, as it then was in the 1950s in the UK, he would need to actually at least have a voice that people would listen to. Um, one of the places that he, he spent a lot of time in during, when he was a child was a, a farm which belonged to a, um, a friend of his down in Carmarthenshire, which is a little bit, bit, little bit further away from Wales. The farm is called Fern Hill. Now, as I was young and easy under the apple boughs, about the lilting house, and happy as the grass was green. The night above the dingle starry, time let me hail and climb, golden in the heydays of his eyes. And honoured among wagons, I was prince of the apple towns. And once upon a time, I lordly had the trees and leaves trail with daisies and barley down the rivers of the windfall light. And as I was green and carefree, famous among the barns, about the happy yard and singing as the half the farm was home, in the sun that is young once only, time, let me play and be golden in the mercy of his means. And green and golden, I was huntsman and herdsman. The calves sang to my horn. The foxes on the hills barked clear and cold, and the, the Sabbath rang slowly in the pebbles of the holy streams. All the sun long it was running, it was lovely. The hay fields high as the house, the tunes from the chimneys, it was air and playing, lovely and watery, and fire green as glass. And nightly, under the simple stars, as I rode to sleep, the owls were bearing the farm away, and moon 
Long I heard, blessed among stables, the night jars flying with the ricks and the horses flashing into the dark. And then to awake, and the farm like a wanderer, white with the dew, come back, the cock on his shoulder. It was all shining, it was Adam and Mabel. The sky gathered again, and the sun grew round that very day. So it must have been after the birth of the simple light, in the first spinning place, the spellbound horses walking warm out of the whinnying green stable onto the fields of trade and honoured among foxes and pheasants by the gay house under the new-made clouds and happy as the heart was long in the sun born over and over i ran my needless ways my wishes raced through the house high hay and nothing i cared of my sky blue trades that time allows in all his tuneful turning so few and such morning songs before the children green and golden follow him out of grace Nothing I cared in the lamb-white days, the time would take me up to the swallow thronged loft by the shadow of my hand in the moon that is always rising, nor that riding to sleep I should hear him fly with the high fields and wake to the farm forever, fled from the childless land. Oh, as I was easy and young in the mercy of his dreams, time held me green and dying. Though I sang in my chains like the sea. No. It gives you can feel extraordinary stuff, isn't it? I mean, you can feel the way in which the words are being moved around, and he's not really concerned about a literal meaning. He's just giving you a set of impressions. However, he did also write. Of some, of a series of, of what he called Memories of Christmas. Um, what was Christmas like in Swansea in the 1940s? I've got John Rodman. Um, and one of these he read of a, a, a BBC radio broadcast, which was called, um, simply called Memories of Christmas. It was on the afternoon of the day of Christmas Eve and I was in Mrs. Prothero's garden, waiting for cats with her son Jim. It was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. A December, in my memory, is white as a Lapland, though there were no reindeers. But there were cats, patient, cold, and callous. Our hands wrapped in socks, we waited to snowball the cats. Sleek and long as jaguars, and terrible whiskered, spitting and snarling, they would slink and sidle over the back, the white back garden walls, and the lynx-eyed hunters, Jim and I, fur-capped and moccasined trappers from Hudson's, Hudson's Bay off Eversley Road, would hurl our deadly snowballs at the green of their eyes. The wise cats never appeared. We were so still, Eskimo-footed Arctic marksmen in the muffling silence of the eternal snows, eternal ever since Wednesday. Though we never heard Mrs. Prothero's first cry from her igloo at the bottom of the garden, or if we heard it at all, it was to us like the far-off challenge of our enemy and prey, the neighbor's polar cat. But soon the voice grew louder. Fire! cried Mrs. Prothero, and she beat the dinner, dinner gong, and we ran down the garden with the snowballs in our arms towards the house, and smoke indeed was pouring out of the dining room, and the gong was bumbulating, and Mrs. Prothero was announcing ruin like a town like a town crier in Pompeii. This was better than all the cats in Wales standing in the wall on a row. We bounded into the house laden with snowballs and stopped at the open door of the smoke filled room. Something was burning all right. Perhaps it was Mr. Provero, who always slept after midday dinner with a newspaper over his face. But he was standing in the middle of the room, saying, A fine Christmas! and smacking at the smoke with a slipper. Call the fire brigade, said Mrs. Provero, as she beat the gong. They won't be there, said Mr. Provero. It's Christmas! There was no fire to be seen, only clouds of smoke, and Mr. Provero standing in the middle of them, 
waving his slipper as though he were conducting. Do something, he said. And he threw all our snowballs into the smoke. I think we missed Mr. Trotter and ran out of the house to the telephone box. Let's call the police as well, Jim said. And the ambulance. And Ernie Jenkins, he likes fires. <laughs> but we only called the fire brigade. And soon the fire engine came and the three, three tall men in helmets brought, the, brought in a hose into the house. And Mr. Prothero got out just in time before he turned it on. Nobody ever had a noisier Christmas. And when the fireman turned off the hose and was standing in the wet and smoky room, Jim's aunt, Miss Prothero, came downstairs and peered at them. Jim and I waited very quietly to hear what she would say to them. She said the right thing, always. She looked at the three tall firemen in their shining helmets, standing among the smoke and cinders and dissolving snowballs, and she said, would you like something to eat? Um, nearby where, where uh, Dylan Thomas lived, in a um, terrace house in the middle of the, the town, there was a, a park called Kung Donkin Park, where he used to go and play and sail boats in the, the, on the, the, uh, in the, in the, uh, the, the ponds and things like that. And very early on, he wrote a, a poem about this park, which is called The Hunchback in the Park. The hunchback in the park, a solitary mister, propped between trees and water, from the opening of the garden lock that lets the trees and water enter until the Sunday somber bell at dark, eating bread from the newspaper, drinking water from the chained cup that the children filled with gravel in the fountain basin where I sailed my ship, slept at night in a dog kennel but nobody chained him up. Like the park birds, he came early. Like the water, he sat down. And Mister, they called, Hey, Mister! The truant boys from the town, running when he had heard them clearly on out of sand, past lake and rockery, laughing when he shook his paper, hunchback in mockery, through the loud zoo of the willow groves, dodging the park keeper with his stick that picked up leaves. And the old dog sleeper, alone between nurses and swans, while the boys among willows made the tigers jump out of their eyes to roar on the rockery stones, and the groves were blue with sailors. Made all day until bell time, a woman, figure without fault, straight as a young elm, straight and tall from his crooked bones, that she might stand in the night after the locks and chains. All night, in the unmade path, after the railings and shrubberies, the birds, the grass, the trees, the lake, and the wild boys, innocent as strawberries, had followed the hunchback to his kennel in the dark. That's kind of all based on, on the way in which he wrote these poems. He was always observing. He was out walking a lot, just watching people. And that clearly is, is having watched this, this poor hunchback in the park. And a lot of his writing is concerned with, with the results of having seen how people behave. Mr. Prothero in the fire, and, and the fireman coming in, and Mrs. Mr. Prothero coming in and saying, is there anything you can read? There are things he's all seen. Um, and, and a lot of his work is concerned with having listened very carefully, watched very carefully, and then put what he's... What he's, uh, what, what he's He's heard and seen into, into poetry of one sort or another. Um, he wrote, he was also very good at writing poems about death, which is very strange, actually, when you consider that, that actually um, he himself died quite, uh, uh, quite um, early. Um, and he wrote one called Do, Co Do, Not Call, Do Not Go Gentle into That Good Night. Which was celebrating, not celebrating, but um, in a way uh, written for his father, who had died like a couple of weeks later, uh, earlier. And I remember when my father-in-law, who was Polish, died 
in Krakow in Poland, which would be about 10 or 15 years ago. We all went over to, to Poland for, for the, uh, the ceremony. He was buried in a, in a big cemetery outside, outside the, the city. Um, and I thought, I, I must read something. I must, I must do something with this, this thing. But I'll read this poem. So I read, um, Do Not Run Gently into Good Night. And I read it. I stood in front of the, uh, the gravestone. I wrote it, uh, read it like as, as Dylan Thomas would have read it. And I realized nobody, actually, anywhere near could understand a word of what I was actually saying. And they were all saying, who is this guy? And why is he standing there reading this poem? Um, so every time I read it now, I, I, I see myself standing in, in the cemetery in Krakow, thinking, yes, well, maybe you will understand it. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end know dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deal, deeds might have danced in a green hay, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late, they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, Curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the day. End of the um, He also, when he was working for the BBC, wrote a, an early radio play, um, which was um, quite an interesting, of which I'll, I'll read you a little portion. Um, this is a play, it's the sort of thing we might all think about in a, in a, a strange way. He um, was thinking about, he wrote it fairly late in his life, but it was actually, the idea was that he was going to go back to Swansea when he was living somewhere else. Go back to Swansea, and he's in, in, imagining himself going back to Swansea and asking people, do you, do you remember this, this, this man who lived here? Do you remember this guy? Do you remember this guy who used to write poems? And this is the, 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 the sort of beginning of it, really. I went into the hotel. Good morning. The hall porter did not answer. I was just another snowman to him. It was the middle of February. He did not know that I was looking for someone after 14 years, and he didn't care. He stood and shuddered, staring through the glass of the hotel door at the snowflakes sailing down the sky like Siberian confetti. The bar was just opening. But only but one, one customer puffed and shook at the counter with a fistful pint of frozen towy water in his wrapped up hand. I said, good morning. And the barmaid, polishing the counter vigorously as though it were a rare and valuable piece of Swansea china, said to her first customer, seen the film of the Elysium, Mr. Griffiths? They're strange, isn't it? Do you come up with your bicycle? Our pipe burned Monday. Pint of bitter, please. Proper little lake in the kitchen. Got to wear your Wellingtons when you boil an egg. One or four, please. The cold just gets me here. And Aikman's chain. That's your liver, Mr. Griffiths. You've been on the cocoa again. Do you remember a friend of mine? He always used to come to this bar some years ago, every morning, about this time. Just by fear it gets me. I don't know what would happen if I didn't wear a band. What's his name? Uh, young Thomas. Lots of Thomases come in here. It's a kind of home from home for Thomases, isn't it, Mr. Griffiths? What's he look like? He'd be about 17 or 18. I was 17 once. And above... Above medium height? Above medium height for whales, I mean. He 
He's five foot six and a half. Thick blubber lips, snub nose, curly mouse, mouse brown hair, one front tooth broken after playing a game called Cats and Dogs in the Mermaid. Numbers. Speaks rather fancy, truculent, plausible. Bit of a shower off. Plus fours and no breakfast, you know. You used to have poems printed in the Herald of Wales. So again, you've got Swansea being used as sort of the background to a lot of what he was writing about. Um, and what's interesting, I think, since, since he died, I think what happened to Welsh poetry was that, that, that people began to realize that, yes, poetry is alive, it is alive still, we can still write. And although Dylan Thomas took a long time to be really recognized in the UK, I think he, he started a huge movement in writing poetry then. Now, I thought I'd read you um, one poem of one of, of uh, the, the younger poets in, in Wales, who I think are definitely influenced by, by Dylan Thomas. The, the poet's name is um, Nigel Jenkins, and he's written this based on a story that he heard um, on a beach, which is just uh, near Swansea. The beach is called Pwllldi, P-W-L-L-D-U. And that's the reason why I'm not speaking Welsh to you today. It, because it's virtually impossible, and it's full of consonants, and you wouldn't understand anyway. And this is, this is called the, ball the Ballad of Pwllldi Head. And Pwllldi is a wonderful beach with a, 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 shingle, a shingle beach and a long path walking down to it. You can't actually drive your car down, you have to work, walk from the cliffs. So it's a long way down, and you get there this beautiful beach. So this is Nigel Jenkins' poem, The Ballad of Pwllldi Head. One long gone winter's time ago, the press to Swansea came to grab for war Welsh sailing boys in the King of England's name. They say that more than 90 souls were snatched from home and street and crammed below the Caesar's deck were dispatched to join the fleet. You're off, said Lieutenant Gaborian, to lawless foreign lands. The parlez-vous wants driving out and the King, God bless him, wants hands. The Caesar sailed and her rested freight, so loath to leave Swansea town, the tide hands high to the timbers, and all hatches were battened down. The ship they feared was a poor match for the Trixie Seven Sea, and they met the swell at Mumble's Head with a chill of anxiety. By Oxwich Point, both wind and tide were standing in her way, so the captain turned her back to seek the calm at Swansea Bay. Mumble's head he was looking for, but the rocks of Foot D he found. As darkness fell and the breakers crashed, the Caesar ran aground. Save yourselves, Gaborian roared to the men dismayed on deck. Those bound below they left behind to perish with the wreck. The Caesar, hold and boulder wedged, began to take in water, and slow as slow the tide rose up, began the captive slaughter. They screamed, they stamped, and pleased did shout, their souls sweet God to save, but all by dawn's departed died, were silent as a grave. And when they held a court martial, and Gaborian was acclaimed, as he whose skills had saved the crew, for the ship's loss, fog was blown. Of those who died in the Caesar's hold, not a word in court was said. And put thee too, the summer's through, keeps dark about its day. But in winter, on that naked point, you'll find a crown of stones, telling of wreckage beneath the turf, a shipful that tyrannized the bones. Great stuff. Um, And I think just one more by Nigel Jenkins, who's also been influenced, I think, very influenced by uh, Dylan Thomas's uh, problem with drink. 
called the Teetotalitarian Lament. <laughs> poor, oh poor, that booze away, said my conscience when it came to call and spotted the dozen bottles of each I'd laid up in the hall. So I pulled the cork from bottle one and poured it down the sink, apart from just one glass of the stuff, a little farewell drink. Then I pulled the cork from bottle two and did more or less the same, except this time I drank two small glasses for which thirst must take the blame. From bottle three, three glasses I took from four, yes, four I drank. Then I grabbed, both whole, uh, I grabbed hold of both the bottles and pulled, poured them down the sink. I pulled out the cork from sink number five, poured the bottle down the glass and drank it. I then pulled the sink from the cork of the next, bottle seven whole pours and sank it. From the next full sink, I pulled the glass and bottled the cork down the pour. I pulled the cork from my throat the glass from the pool and drank a few sinks more. <laughs> when, I, when I'd emptied everything, I steadied the house with one hand <laughs> and counted with the other the bottles and the corks. Some fifty at first I scanned. I counted again when the houses came by and got them all, about a hundred I think, except for one house and a bottle, which I promptly proceeded to drink. So that's it. Uh, so that's uh, that's Nigel Jenkins. So I thought that I'd, I'd end with a, um, one of uh, Dylan's essays, really, on his visit to America. So this is quite it's quite um, interesting. But it sort of sums up the situation, the situation I'm in here, really. Um, Across the United States of America, from New York to California and back, glazed again for many months of the year, there streams and sings for its heady supper a dazed and prejudiced procession of European lecturers, scholars, sociologists, economists, writers, authorities on this and that, and even in theory on the United States of America. And breathlessly, between addresses and receptions, in planes and trains and boiling hotel bedroom ovens, many of these attempt to keep journals and diaries. At first, confused and shocked by shameless profusion, and almost shamed by generosity and accustomed to such importance as they are assumed by their hosts to possess, and up against the barrier of a common language, they write in their notebooks like demons generalizing away on character and culture and the American political scene. But towards the middle of the middle-aged whisk through the middle western clubs and universities, the fury of the writings flags. Their spirits are lowered by the spirit in which they are everywhere strongly greeted, and which in over-increasing droves they find themselves lower. They begin to mistrust themselves and their reputations. They find too often that an audience will receive a lantern lecture on, say, ceramics, with the same uninhibited enthusiasm that it recorded the week before to a paper on the modern Turkish novel. And in their diaries, more and more do such entries appear, such as, no way of escape, or, or buffalo, or I'm beaten, until at last they can't write a word. And twittering all over, old before their time, with, uh, with eyes like wristles in the sand, they helped up the gangway of the homebound liner, or, or the uh, uh, plane now, by kind bosom friends of all kinds and bosoms who boil, bo boister them on the back, pick them up again, thrust bottles, sonnets, cigars, addresses into their pockets, have a farewell party in their cabin, pick them up and sniggering and yelping are gone to wait at the dockside for another boat from Europe and another batch of fresh green lectures. There they go every spring from New York to Los Angeles. Exhibitionists, polemicists, histrionic publicists, theological rhetoricians, historical hoddy-doddies, ballotomains, ulterior decorators, windbags, and bigwigs and humbugs, men in love with stamps, men in love with stakes, 
men after millionaires' widows, men with elephantitis of reputation, huge trunks and teeny minds, authorities on gas, bishops, bestsellers, editors looking for writers, writers looking for publishers, publishers looking for dollars, existentialists, serious physicists with nuclear ambitions, men from the BBC who speak as though they had the Elgin marbles in their mouths, <laughs> pot-boiling philosophers, professional Irishmen, and I'm afraid fat poets with slim volumes. And see too in that linguaceous, oh, this is a word I can't even pronounce, a linguaceous stream, the tall monocled men, spelling of saddle soap and club armchairs, their breath a nice blending of whiskey and fox's blood with big protruding upper class tusks and county moustaches, presumably invented in England and sent abroad to ad ad advertise punch who lecture to women's clubs on unlikely subjects such as the history of etching in the Shetland Islands. <laughs> and the brassy, bossy men-women with corrugated iron perms and hippo hides who come self-announced as ordinary British housewives to talk to rich, minked chunks of American matronhood about the iniquity of the health services, the criminal slope of the miners, the visible taint on the horns of Mr. Narin Devon, and the fear of everyone in England to go out alone at night because of the organized legions of cosh boys against which the police are powerless owing to the refusal of those in power to equip them with the revolvers and to flog to ribbons every uh, adolescent offender of any charge at all. And there, shiver and teeter also, meek and driven, those British authors, unfortunate enough to have written after years of unadventurous forgotten work, one bad novel, which became enormously popular on both sides of the Atlantic. <laughs> At home, when success first hit them, they were mildly delighted. A couple of literary luncheons went sugar tipsy to their heads, like the washing sherry served before those luncheons. And perhaps as the lovely money rolled lushly in, they began to dream in their moony writer's way of being able to retire to the country, keep wasps, or was it bees, and never write another word. But in come the literary agent's trigger men and the publisher's armed narcs. You must go to the States and make a personal appearance. Your novel is killing them over there, and we're not surprised either. You must go around the States lecturing to women. <coughs> and the inoffensive writers, who've never dared lecture anyone, let alone women, they are frightened of women. They do not understand women. They write about women as rich creatures that never existed. And the women lap it up, these sensitive plants, they cry out, but what shall we lecture about? The English novel. I don't read novels. Great women in fiction. I don't like fiction or women. <laughs> but off they're wafted, first class, in the plush bowels of the Queen Victoria, with a list of engagements, long as a New York menu, or a half hour with a book by Charles Morgan and soon they're losing their little cold as goldfish paw in the general glutinous handshake of a clutch of enveloping hostesses. So that was Thomas, having done his lecture tour. So that's it then. So thank you for being a lovely audience and listening to it all. <laughs>